down, down, down into the sea, sang Jonah. Gasping and nearly drowning, but God was not yet fi finished with Jonah. He sent a big fish to swallow Jonah in one gulp. Jonah found himself in the stomach of a great fish. Oh, it's so dark in here. What will become for me now? Maybe God will still hear me. Jonah turned to the Lord. Lord, thank you for saving me. Inside the fish, Jonah prayed for three days. I'm sorry I tried to hide from you. Please let me out of this terrible prison. I will do as you commanded. God heard Jonah and knew he had changed. He made the fish spit out Jonah onto the land. Thank you, merciful Lord, for delivering me safely to land. Now, Jonah. Go to Nineveh and tell those wicked people I am going to destroy them. Yes, Lord, I'm listening. One of the comments that I have received in our study of Jonah is, I didn't know there was so much in that little book. There is so much more to Jonah that goes beyond just a surface level reading of the story. And I hope by now that you recognize that this story is, is it's not asking the question, can a man live inside a fish? It's making us wrestle with a better question. How long can a man live with God when he is outside of his will? Is Jonah ever going to surrender to a mission that makes him angry? And the genius of the book is that it ends in such a way that the answer actually becomes your concern. So we know that Nineveh has had one of the greatest revivals in the history of the world, a revival Jonah did not pray for, a revival that Jonah did not want. And neither Nineveh nor Jonah knows what is going to happen. But Jonah suspects God is a Christian and he's going to spare Nineveh. And that thought makes him very angry. And that's where we pick up our story. Jonah chapter 4, beginning in the fifth verse, we read these words. Jonah went out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter. He sat in its shade and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a vine and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the vine. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the vine so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, It would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Do you have a right to be angry about the vine? I do, he said. I'm angry enough to die. But the Lord said, You have been concerned about this vine Though you did not tend it or make it grow, it sprang up overnight and it died overnight. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left and many cattle as well. Should I not be concerned about that great city? So this great revival breaks out. And you would think that Jonah would want to promote that, that he would want it to be prolonged. You'd think that he would be inside of the city and he would set up studies where they can look at God's word more in depth and he would have prayer meetings. Instead, he goes outside of the city so that he can have a pout fest. Because the truth is, deep down, he really wants Nineveh to backslide. He thinks, if I get away and there's no prophet of God in the city, 
Then they will forget that I was ever there and they'll go back to their old ways and then God can go and destroy the city. While he's out there, something happens that has not happened in the entire story. Jonah gets happy. Have you known people so consistently unhappy that if they ever get happy, you notice it? What makes this guy who has been so miserable for four chapters now happy? Is it the repentance of Nineveh? Is it his own obedience to the will of God and go to Nineveh? No. What makes Jonah happy is a plant. Because when you have spent most of your life being hot about something, a little shade is welcome. So Jonah takes his place in a long line of people who want to be comfortable more than they want to participate in what God is doing on earth. You see, both Jonah and God are concerned, but Jonah is concerned about Jonah's concerns. He is the poster child for, it's all about me, which is the thinking that has dominated every time and every culture to this very day. It dominates our politics. We don't vote over what's best for the majority. We vote for what's best for me. It dominates our economics in the way that we use our money. It even dominates our faith. We have many people who never move past a level of faith that says, bless me, help me. And sadly, many churches and pastors baptize that shallow me faith by building it's all about you churches. You can find them everywhere. They promote themselves. We built this church with you in mind. So what happens when you get people to come to church who thinks it's all about me and you tell them church is all about you, you get exactly what you deserve, a church full of people who are constantly unhappy about plant issues. I have a lot of friends in the ministry. And I realize I am very sincerely blessed to be the preacher at Fort Des Moines Church of Christ. Today marks 19 complete years that I've stood behind this pulpit. So many preachers are so frustrated. There's a great crisis in the church in America when over 70% of ministers are quitting because they are so tired of trying to keep plant-thinking people happy. Because they don't complain about why they're, doing, why they're not doing more to reach the lost, or they don't say, why aren't you challenging me to sacrifice more, to pray more? Nope, it's simply, why isn't this church doing more to keep me happy? Here's the truth. What we want is rarely ever what we need most. And so sometimes, just like Jonah, God intentionally puts us in uncomfortable situations to make us reassess our priorities and discern whether our concerns are lining up with God's concerns. Because frankly, God isn't concerned about a lot of the things that concern us. You see, God is concerned for those who are ignorant and even disobedient. He says, Jonah, there's 120,000 people who don't know their right hand from their left. They're just kids, Jonah. Yes, the city is full of a lot of people that do know right from wrong, and they do wrong anyway. But Jonah, here's the truth. I'm concerned for both groups. That's just what God is like. And this story is asking us to like what God is like. And God is saying, Jonah, I don't divide the world up like you do. I don't divide the world up into us, them. I divide the world up into my found children and my lost children. And this story is starting to ask us to look at the world through the eyes of God, especially for the great cities of the world. I remember 
back in the, in the early 90s, going to the RCA Dome in Indianapolis, Indiana, to a Promise Keepers event. 63,000 men packed into this stadium, all of them praising the name of the one true king. It was, it was an absolutely incredible experience. And for just a moment while I was there, it's like I could feel the Holy Spirit letting me know that every single man in that stadium there that day was very loved by God. But on another day, when 63,000 men and women would pack into that stadium and be equally passionate about a ball being carried around a field, I realized God loves every single one of them just as much. None of us has earned His favor. You see, God is concerned for all of His children, His found children and his lost children. It's why we support ministries like Blessing Hearts International. Why should we be concerned about the people in Haiti? Because God is. Haiti is full of the ignorant and even the disobedient. It also has people like Dee and Wickley Dorsey who are serving Jesus every single day. It's just 90 minutes south of our country from Miami, but people there have so little. There is such a great need. So let me ask you some questions. Will you sacrifice financially for the mission of God? Will you consider ever spending part of your life in another country for the mission of God? Will you, will you pray and speak to your children about considering ever being a missionary for God? And if we're serious about following Jesus, the answer should be, yeah, I'll do that. Jesus pursued God's mission with a fully engaged heart because he knew the heart of God and he knew that his father was concerned for the whole world, even the animals. Don't you love how the story ends? Jonah, why would I destroy a city full of kids and animals? You see, God is concerned about the redemption of all creation. The last words of this book give a glimpse of just how cosmic the concern of God actually is. It's a, a sneak peek at the size of the redemption that he has planned. Jonah loved a plant. God loves a planet. And he's intending for every single atom of his creation to be reached by his saving grace. That's why Peter would preach in Acts chapter 3, he must remain in heaven until the time comes for God to restore everything as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. God is on a mission to transform the world that is into the world that is coming. By the way, Creation is concerned about this as well. Paul says that creation is groaning for its redemption. Creation is not groaning to be destroyed. It's groaning to be redeemed. Creation doesn't want to be put out of its misery. Creation wants to be put back the way it was before sin messed up everything. And God is going to do that. His redemption is going to reach the people and even the animals. In fact, I, I just have to tell you, I have concluded there will be cats in heaven. God knows we need something to hunt. <laughs> the mission of Jesus is the ultimate restoration movement. The Bible says in the 8th chapter of Romans that creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay. There is nothing small about the mission of God. There's nothing small about the grace that it requires. There's nothing small about the sacrifice that heaven makes for this mission. That's why it always baffles God that what makes us angry or happy is so pitifully small. You see, God is concerned that we are not as concerned as He is. We tend to care more about dying plants than we do about dying souls. 
You see, the point of the book of Jonah is not to teach us that God loves the world. The point is that we know God loves the world, and it's still not that big of a concern to us. We get more passionate about things that make us uncomfortable than we do about people being unsaved. What makes you happy? I mean, really, really happy. Your team winning? You get a better car? The person you vote for got elected? You know what makes heaven happy? When one of God's lost kids comes home. Heaven is happy. And at some point we have to ask the question, does what concern God become very compelling to me? If we're not very concerned about God's mission, have we really understood or even grasped God's grace? God's been so good to Jonah. And he was still unconcerned about those who still needed to taste the goodness of the Lord. The great old preacher Charles Haddon Spurgeon was was asked one time, do you really think that people who have never heard the gospel are really lost? He had a great answer. He answered with a question. Do you really think that people that say they believe in Jesus and have never really gone anywhere to tell somebody about Jesus are really saved? Jesus only ever made one direct prayer request. He taught us to pray. He taught us a prayer. But one time, only once, did Jesus directly make a prayer request. It's in Matthew chapter 9. It says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. It's because he had God's heart. He had, he had compassion on them. They were confused. They're helpless. And he continues. It says, Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. That's how the story of Jonah ends. With, with God... Wanting Jonah to enter the field, and that is the tension. You see, will Jonah be swallowed by the mission of God? No. We already know he can be swallowed by a fish, but that's not even important. What's really important is if he is swallowed by the passion, the heart, the mission of the God that he claims he loves. Will the man that witnessed the greatest revival in history have a revival in his own heart? Well, you say, well, we don't know. The book just stops. That's the genius of the way that the Holy Spirit wrote the book. Because the Holy Spirit wants you and me to finish the story. Because you are Jonah. So am I. And we get to decide what kind of ending this story gets. Watch this. Meanwhile, God, Jonah climbed a hill above the city and sat down to watch God dis dis destroy it. He waited and waited. I feel like a fool. All my work has wasted. God is not destroying Nineveh. Jonah. Yes, Lord. Jonah, will you never learn my love? My love is great. It is greater than my anger, and it is for all my creatures. Didn't I give you another chance? Yes, you did. Now I am giving the Ninevites another chance. Go now, Jonah, and try to love as I do. Then you will be a true man of God. Yay for God! He has forgiven us! Yay! Rah! Hooray! So Jonah began his long journey home and tried to love as God had taught him. The end. That's the genius of our story. You get to decide if this has a happy ending or not. So what ending are you going to write? 
Because here's the thing about concern. It is concrete. It's, it's tangible. It's like repentance. If it is very real, then you can notice it. You notice it by the way that you show people your faith. You notice it by the way that you go. You notice it by the way that you give. How does the story of Jonah end for you? Would you stand up? I want to pray over you. Father God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the wonderful story of Jonah in the Bible. God, help us to, to leave this place with a concern, God, for everyone. May we not leave before we see the desperate need of people in Haiti. May we be impacted at the slightest level to give. Help us, God, to be moved to look at people the way that you do. God, we understand we are really Jonah. We run from you more than we run to you. I pray, God, this day it changes, that we show in a very tangible way how we're ending this story. We pray this prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen.